From the very earliest time, men have used the concept of the eye as a symbol of consciousness. Science, past, present, future, is converging to the knowledge of higher consciousness. We are at a dynamic moment in history, recognizing that we are local and non-local human beings connected with our sensory system, which makes use of the pineal gland. This eye single is a mysterious kind of eye, the all-seeing eye of the Masonic lodges. The same all-seeing eye that is found frequently in the artistry of cathedrals. Descartes had ja die tollkühne Behauptung aufgestellt, dass die Zirbeldrüse Sitz der Seele sei. This is why information was classified on it for so many years, because it holds the secret to consciousness. Das Thema Erwachen und Bewusstseinserweiterung hat ganz erheblich etwas mit einer aktiven Zirbeldrüse zu tun. With the pineal gland activated and the two hemispheres energetically united, the neurons within both hemispheres receive the visual stimuli necessary for interactions with the higher worlds. Man must have some means of cognition which is beyond the sensory perceptions as we know them. Each and every one of us has an inner looking glass. All we have to do is activate our own internal portal. Hey, hey, Inspire Tribe, my fellow freedom lovers, and John Nolan here. Thank you so much for joining us again for another Inspired Conversation. We just watched a trailer of Frank Jacobs' 2023 webinar, The Inner Looking Glass. Absolutely a uh, wonderful, wonderful webinar that has inspired people around the world. And today we're bringing back Frank Jacob for the last conversation of 2023. Uh, we're going to go deep into some, we think, important topics of the day, of the year, moving forward. And then in the second part of our conversation, we're going to go into a live Q&A where you get to ask questions and Frank will answer them. Uh, you just join a live chat here on YouTube. We're going to try to keep an eye on Rumble as well. Uh, so my friends, without further ado, please welcome with me our dear friend, uh, your favorite, Frank Jacob. Hey, John. How's it going, brother? Very well. How are you? Well, obviously not winding down, my friend. Uh, we're we're doing well, and like you, we're keeping busy. I know you you just got back from the states. You were a few states over in West Virginia, doing a talk, and and you've been traveling a lot this year, Frank. I have. Uh, I have been. Yeah. You know, you're you're everywhere. You're everywhere right now, and you said you're not slowing down, which is great. Uh, Frank, we we kind of we said we were going to talk about 2023 and a little bit about 2024 moving forward. What has happened? What what, what we both are thinking is important, and uh, what to focus on moving into the future. And I I kind of couldn't think of a better way than what you suggested. Uh, we both watched a movie, and uh, we might be sorry that we watched it, but we watched it, so now we might as well talk about it. What <laughs> movie was it? Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience, because I think a lot of the people out there might have seen as well. Well, it was funny. I was down in I was in um, I was in um, West Virginia for the Arlington Institute talk, and I hung there a couple of days. And while I was there, I saw this trailer for a film called Leave the World Behind, you know, with big players in it like Julia Roberts and. Ethan Hawke and, you know, people that uh, you think, OK, well, this must be something to take serious. Right. Uh, if that many if, you know, obviously those are high paid actors, they wouldn't be in an, just a regular flick. So I tuned into it and I was watching it and immediately became apparent that this thing was like, well, I guess there's a word for it. It's called predictive programming. And we've been talking about that on some of our shows. This is the way you can kind of test the waters if you are, you know, if you are like a, in the cabal or part of the elite. And you've got plans, big plans. Big plans take big planning. And part of that, I think, is, and this is kind of, that's something which has become clear to me about these kinds of films, is that they're simulations in themselves. They're like live simulations, you could say, to see 
you know, to take a temperature of where people are still at. If they're waking up, are they completely gone? Is there some resistance? Or they might even be checking out ideas, like in this film in particular, you know, what is the big concept in this film? And I guess we should, you know, tell people that are watching this, spoiler alerts, we're going to be digging into stuff. Yeah, totally. We, we can't really discuss film. it. We can't really discuss it. The first spoiler alert, Frank, is it was executive executive producers were uh, Barack and Big Mike, right? Those are their uh, executive producers of the movie. Yeah, here, let me show you. I got a screenshot. This is, this is you know, you're watching the intro flicks, right? And yeah. I couldn't believe my eyes, right? It was like executive producer, right? And, and, I, and I, you know, you probe and dig a little deeper and you find out that um, not just executive producer, but actually giving the director, in this case, Sam Esmail, uh, pointers and script uh, revisions to match reality. And I looked up Sam Esmail because the name is an interesting name and he's obviously, a, uh, you know, a very well-known director. And if you look at the etymology of his name, it comes up as essentially a child so named was regarded as the fulfillment of a divine promise. So it, it already in the, in the credits is, yes, really is you know, it's getting, it's getting into this idea of prophecy or of, of, of like where things are moving. So they they don't hold back it's like I would call it a no hold bars approach to let's throw all our symbology at them, right? And let's just see, you know, what and even to the point where the symbology is dynamically changing as the film is evolving. That's not something you're going to necessarily see. We're, we can we can get into that a little bit, but that well, was clear. Yeah, I just want to give a, a quick uh, overview of you know kind of how the the movie what it depicts is basically like so many movies, a scenario of an attack, in this case on the United States, that doesn't appa apparently express itself as an attack in the beginning. It just turns out it is that. Um, you know, the cinematography is interesting at best and horrible probably at worst to describe it, but really uh, it also doesn't end on a very satisfying note. But the journey of the movie is very interesting in, in the symbology, in the hidden meanings, in the open meanings, what it portrays. So, uh, Frank, I'm kind of going to let you just take it away, leave the world behind. What was your impression? What did you think while watching the movie? Well, I mean, the first thing, like I already mentioned, is is the use of satanic symbology or let's just say, you know, those of us who have been having an eye on the music industry videos where they sometimes get much more adventurous with their provocation with respect to Luciferian or satanic imagery, they went right in that direction with this film right off the bat. Like, you know, one of the things that I made a screenshot here is, for example, just the credits of the person who wrote the novel is, you know, the all-seeing eye. Mm -hmm. And it's the colors, the, 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 uh, these satanic colors, black, red, and white. I mean, it, you know, the colors in themselves are not a problem, but it's, it's a code, right? And then you see the number 666 there, right? I, I just about fell off my, my chair, right? Because if you look at, you know, right, right there, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but um, you can see six on the cup. The, the clock has the pointer pointing at six. And on the far end of his bed, there's another number six, you know? Okay. So, you, right? you, it's, you went deep. I didn't catch that. Oh, no. I mean, it's like it's it, this is not accidental um, at all, John. This is stuff that this is when you see this kind of placement, you know, it's you know, it's it's along the lines of, you know, what we see in things like this. Right. We have mm -hmm. if you look at media. Right. What do you see there? You see the same kind of symbology like here, for example. This is something that somebody pointed out to me a, a year ago or something and started collecting. You know, if you look at the covers of Time magazine, right? It's like again, if you see the cover on its own, you probably wouldn't notice it, but you see them all put together, and it's it's very clear that there's um I think that they're saying to us here, we're in charge. Um, this is another uh one of our message uh, medias. Uh, and most people will not notice those things. Like there's another uh, symbology, like here's one that you probably definitely didn't check this one out. I didn't either. Somebody else pointed this out and I went back to the film and looked at it, right? In the beginning of the film, you know, uh, you see Julia Roberts's character standing in the top left there in front of this painting in this obviously very rich house that they, this, this Airbnb. 
as the film progresses to the right of that, if you look at an, a scene later on, you can start seeing the painting becoming less and less refined. Whereas the first version, there was four pillars, almost representing the husband, wife, and the two children, you know, mm. black and white, right? And then all of a sudden, black and white turn, turns to more smudgy, less defined, you know, and, and also the character evolve development is turning less defined. And at the very end, which I have at the bottom here, near the end of the film, it's completely changed. Now you've got no definition. It's it's a mishmash. And it, it's the symbol, really the symbology of essentially saying to us, you know, this idea of the family unit, this idea, even the idea of, you know, the subtle racist tones or, you know, imagery that is like saying, you know, there's black and there's white. Well, eventually, and especially in the film, there's the protagonists who is essentially this, I guess, I don't know, hard to call them protagonists, but let's just say the main characters, the white family of four, and then the supporting characters, which is this um, black man and his daughter who work, he works for the cabal. And it's funny. And he's in the role of the millionaire who owns the rich suburban house outside of New York and the white families, you know, going on the vacation in his house. So you've got, you're starting to mix up right away this idea of, yeah, exactly. So that's one of the first things you kind of you kind of get on um, on the road with the film right off the off the bat. You see this kind of imagery, and and I think like you pointed out in our in our pre talk, there are some characters, and especially the one character is this uh, the daughter of the couple um, of the white couple. Her name is Rose, and she's got the weirdest look, and you know it's. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's a scary looking kid. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, she was a scary looking kid. weird looking kid, right? And it represents that generation, the last generation, or you know, Zed or whatever, you know, and who are normally just caught up in video games and in their own little reality. And funny enough, she's the character that is the one who's the most observant to um to events that are happening in the film. And I think the first most profound one that we notice is when she, they go to the beach, right? <laughs> Sitting on the beach and they look at, and she looks out and she sees this boat coming, you know, first it's far off, right? And it's getting closer and closer. And she suddenly goes like, what is the, why this boat's moving toward us, right? And then of course the last, the mother looks up and then the last one to see it, of course, is the man. The husband, he's the most clued out. We can get into that a little bit, talking about that particular characterization. But I looked at this boat right off the bat, and I thought, you know, they made the name very obvious. Again, you've got the colors, red, white, and black, that I was talking about in the credits, right? And the name is White Line, and, and I'm thinking that's got to have some meaning. And then, you know, later, as I was digging around and putting together some more research about it, you find out, and there's another number which appears in the film, and that is on the screen, it's called 1619. And so what you find is that 1619 was the date that, the, I guess, one of the first slave ships with Hebrews on board was brought to America and landed... Um, in actually the name of the town is the same name. What is it again? It's um, remember what the name of the town was Port Hope or something like that. Yeah. It, it, or comfort or something like that. Comfort, but I, yeah. yeah. Like something. Yeah. Port comfort. Right. And, and it's funny that that's like, there's no coincidence that in the year 1619, the boat called white lion brought the first slaves to America and port comfort. Right. <laughs> it's like, there's no way that's a coincidence. Like, no, right? no, no, it's not. So it's and the whole, so there you're introducing the idea. What is that? Slaves, right? Slaves brought to America to the new world. And you would think, okay, what does that have to do with the film, really? Well, you find out that, again, you know, going back to this um, analogy of slavery, you've got the black man and his daughter coming back to the house because they obviously are experiencing what's going on with the world out there, which is going crazy. Uh, they come back and they end up sleeping in the basement. You know, because they're like, OK, they convinced the family. And what does the basement look like? It looks like one of those ships, those old slave ships where they, you know, below the gully, they used to stash the slaves and he's got to sleep on the floor, you know, and they've got symbology in that room, like a map on the wall. And I put a little picture of it here. If you look at that map, right, what is it a map of? It's a map of America divided up into four and it's put up on that wall. So you're thinking, 
okay, is that another coded message that when this breakdown of society in America takes place, we've heard about that. We've heard about this dividing things up into zones, into areas, right? So yeah, the, the Hunger Games shows this perfectly, right? How it's supposed to, but uh, really just to, to, for those who haven't seen the movie, you don't know the story. So basically at this point where we are is what the protagonists know is that uh, there is no internet and no TV stations or radio stations are working. So basically comms are off. Phones are not working. Comms are off. Power is still there. They still have power, but no comms whatsoever. And at this point, they know it's a blackout of some sort, but nobody knows yet whether it's uh, an attack, an accident, whatever. But then it gets pretty dark pretty soon. It gets pretty clear what's going on pretty soon, right? Right, exactly. And, I, and I, you know, the way we jumped into it here right now is about as confusing, I guess, as, it, as you are when you're in the film, because you don't know, like you decide, you don't really know, like you describe what's happening in the film yet. You just know there's, you know, the, the, the again, the young girl figures out the TV's not working, right? And then eventually you get some pictures, you get like this up on the screen, and that's where it's kind of made clear what we're talking about here. We're talking about a cyber attack across the entire country. And again, they're showing us the map and the question comes, you know, is this a map that could depict reality if this is indeed a simulation and they're trying to program us toward anticipating something like this? Well, on the map, you see the high and substantial areas of disruption, of course, corresponding to the areas in America where the technology is at the highest, you know, the highest dependency, if you want to put it that way, right? And, and then so, populated, yeah. Right. And of course, we also have, we know that the WEF has been talking for, for the last two or three years. Like I got a slide of that. You have to see that, right? The WEF announces, you know, in a new report that a catastrophic mutating cyber event will strike the world in two years. And the article is from 2023. Okay, yeah, so wh who else said that in the next two years something catastrophic would remember Fauci? Yeah, remember Fauci? Also, uh, Klaus Schwab, he's been saying there will be a comprehensive cyber attack, uh, on the infrastructure of the whole world, practically. So, we you know, we got Klaus on record for that too, absolutely. And so, again, I think this is for me, this was very, very interesting because I'm thinking about the idea of this test run. And we know that uh, COVID-19, before it hit the world, you know, there was talk about everything that had taken place preceding it already in the months beforehand. And they were doing these simulation games in case of, of an emergency that would happen. And so, you know, one of the things that a lot of people don't necessarily know about is, is that these um, that there is a, actually a world simulation happening since at least 2006, okay, there was a, a paper that was put out of Purdue University announcing something called the Sentient World Simulation. I have a screenshot of it up here if you want to see it. This is up. This is right off of Wikipedia. This is no conspiracy theory. This is happening since at least, well, we're talking how long is that now? 15 years at least, right? Maybe That's longer, 17, 17 yeah. years, all right, since 2006, right? So, um, and then if you look in dig down into this whole sentient world simulation, you know, you come up with the ultimate goal envisioned by the person, this is a person who published that paper, is to be a continuously running, continually updated mirror model of the real world that can be used to predict and evaluate future events and courses of action. SWS will react to actual events that occur anywhere in the world and incorporate newly sensed data from the real world as the models influence each other and shared synthetic environment, behaviors and trends emerge in the synthetic world as they do in the real world. Analysis can be performed on the trends in the synthetic world to validate alternative worldviews. I mean, that's pretty damn shocking, I think. And we talked about it. our whole last episode was kind of a mind bomb, right? This builds on that even further. We're talking about like what is, you know, we've been talking a lot about, and you have, I've, I've watched some of your, something called NPCs, right? Non-player characters, right? And what they are and what they represent. This is exactly really what's going on here. 
you know, there's actually it's the lines between what is the real world and what is the fake simulation of the real world are are becoming gray, just like in that painting, in that draw in that in that actual film that they put out there. So like they're dropping all this stuff out there as if almost to prepare us for something like that is big. Obviously, in the case of this film, they're preparing us for a cyber attack, right? But you have to ask yourself if if Barack Obama and his wife or you know buddy Michelle are <laughs> yeah are involved in the script writing and the supervision of this thing. Um, why would they give us, you know, why would they give away? Because, you know, if they're going to do a, a cyber attack, John, wouldn't they surprise us with it, right? So the thing is here, that what comes into play is that sometimes these simulations or these live runs where they drop in a film to see what's going on and they drop in symbology to see who's tuning in and talking about it like we are right now on our show um, are really just, um, they're not necessarily going to do a cyber attack. You know, it's getting us geared up for this idea of like if they can get people afraid and in fear. This is another big topic we've had all year. This idea of fear, but it being in a fear state, you're not in your um, highest, most powerful creative mode of manifesting in the world. When you're in fear, you're in flight or fight uh, mode, right? So you're going to run, you're going to react. You're not going to be making the best, most spiritually high decisions about how to move forward in your reality right so a film like this is perfect to, to see sort of gauging the fear but also the idea that there's going to be people coming forward and saying you see they predicted there's going to be a cyber attack right and then it didn't happen so all of your conspiracy theories this is all bunk you know you're always falling into the same conspiracy right so they're trying to get us to sort of like to fool us into believing that something's going to happen, then they don't pull it off. But instead, it's like a magic trick. They're working on another trick. And they've got a few other tricks up their sleeve, right? Of course, but but let's let's be clear. Um, a comprehensive cyber attack, as depicted in this movie, which was really comprehensive, it, it affected everything that was nece uh, necessary for modern life. Uh, you know, we're talking, It's it's like saying... Uh, they're developing all these weapons and they're never going to use them. Well, that's bullshit. Of course, they're using them. That's the reason why they develop most of the weapons. There are only a few that are used as threats. The rest is used to use them. And so what what could be more damaging to a Western modern society than a cyber? Nothing is more damaging. We see this daily now as, as big platforms are down, websites are down, banks are down. Uh, we had what can't, Australia that had a major... Uh, um, telecommunication provider down for one day and Canada down for one day, billions of dollars in damages, but more importantly, a lot of human damage because everybody relies. And this is what I wanted to jump on, Frank, here is I was shocked that not a single character in this movie was even remotely had a, a sort of a spiritual appearance or some sort right. of wisdom appearance. There was one guy that was depicted as the prepper guy and he was an asshole. I mean, he, he was just scared basically, but the rest of the protagonists, even the guy that kind of worked with, as in, I would say on the outskirts of the cabal, he didn't really have any inside knowledge, but on the outskirts, the 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 owner, the black owner of the house, even he was zero prepared really for any kind of out of the ordinary situation, not spiritually, not mentally, not physically. And that was just shocking to see. And I wonder, is that an accurate depiction or is that just the worst case scenario? Well, I think when they do that, they're 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 kind of mocking us. I look at these things also as a form of mockery. And the way they depict the you know average white male now in this modern family is a clueless guy. Right? What does he do? You know, they've got us he he's like on that topic, like he he's preparing, right? So what does he do? He fills the bathtub with water. Like brilliant, right? Outside we've got a swimming pool. <laughs> Put in a you know a bit of <laughs> detox in there, like chlorine, let it evaporate, and you've got something to drink, right? But no, he's filling up the bathtub because he's never ever thought about this. And the other guy is perusing his neighbor's house, and he finds a GPS phone. That's his idea of connecting. Satellite phone, yeah. satellite phone is to connect with the world, and the, of course, the satellite phone doesn't work because the satellites are offline, right? So again, it's mocking 
us because it's telling people, see, you're you're just not ready at all. You're not ready. And and it's true that I mean what they were trying to say in the mess. Oh, yeah. And this is another thing, you know, that the kids, right? And it's like again along this theme. I'll show you this picture. Look at the t-shirts, right? The kid, yeah. the boy, right? He's wearing one that says obey, right? Who like who do you do you know any kids that would wear a t-shirt called obey? Right. Actually, it's it's become a trend, of course, because you know that's. But yeah, actually, I've maybe seen it, it is right. And next to him is his sister, and what is she wearing? NASA, right? So put the two together, right? Obey NASA. Again, here we've got you know whether or not it's intended, but we know now with the symbology, everything in this film was intended. And then the guy's T-shirt, like he loses you know, in the film. Uh, you know the the boy, the the teenager, he's lost. You know he's totally lost in his own adolescent and and pre-pubescent world he's fantasizing about the daughter of the black guy etc and in the end you know he goes out and he gets affected by something and he loses his teeth and they have to go to the neighbor and they get they give him they end up giving him medication look at his t-shirt right it says primitive right meaning we're going to return to primitive mankind right but first they had to do this this battle right so again here is the other theme in the movie not not that preppers are you know something that are to be you know, maybe honored or respected. No, the prepper comes across like, you know, right away violent and they end up in a standoff. And the message is they don't believe that humanity has the ability in the crisis to pull together. And they're mocking us with that directly in this film. And I believe completely the opposite is true. Every time I've seen any kind of a, a crisis happen, at least in the neighborhood around here, is people end up pulling together. Because they realize what's at stake. And unfortunately, it's always those things that, you know, that are always crisis oriented, which remind people that, hey, it's actually better to kind of connect with your neighbor. And, you know, at the very least, they do it then. But the message here is that maybe it's, you know, maybe it's time to start to think about these things. Think about what it would be like to communicate with your neighbor and think about, um, you know, uh, what would happen in a situation like this. Would you? open your house and you know but then again you know if you look at many of the on the flip side of the coin many of the people that are unconscious out there they might come to your door like that and say move but, out you know well the same people who who called everybody who does prepare in some ways for extraordinary times and events call them crazy are the ones who're going to show up at their door and saying well give me some of those crazy food that you got foods that you got stored away uh frank uh, you know, there's a few more things in the movie to talk about. What I what I just wanted to share because it came up is, um, according to our to our friends at FLFE, they do a lot of calibrations around the level of consciousness, right? And they told us that, unsurprisingly, Christmas time around Christmas time, that's the highest level of consciousness that, on average, that the Earth is in during the 365 days of a year. It is no coincidence for me that a movie like that, you know, with the producers, including the Obamas, would be dropped to really pull down uh, this, uh, the, you know, the, the, this actually, you know, beautiful spirited time to really pull down the mood uh, because that's what they, they do, right? They don't want those periods. They don't want higher consciousness. And if you let it, it will pull you down. It can Absolutely. pull you down. Um, how do you how do you view i want to talk a little bit about the girl uh rose because she sees things like you say she sees the animals coming in like uh you know uh hundreds of deer that show up in a suburban area all of a sudden she sees this the adults are oblivious i mean they're just idiots they don't see anything but to me really christine pointed something out at the end of the movie the girl does something says something and then does something and that to me was a positive sign if you choose to read it like that. How did you experience her throughout the movie? And what, what do you think she symbolizes? You know, the thing, I think the most profound scene that she is in is she has this prophetic dream. And, you know, she's, this isn't sort of midway through the film or the second, like the second third or something like that of the film. And in this dream, you know, she she sees uh, she talks about this story about a guy who was in a flood, and he's a spiritual man. He's a man of God, right? And he's the the floods are going to come. He hears the radio broadcast, and he's like, 
you know what? God's going to save me. I'm I'm a religious man. I'm good. You know, and then he doesn't do anything, right? Then the floods actually start. And water comes rushing in and a boat comes by his house. And he's probably standing on the roof, I think, at this time. And the boat people say to him, come on, you know, we'll rescue you. And he's like, no, it's all good. You know, I'm, you know, God's going to take care of me. Everything's fine, right? So the boat takes off, right? The floods get worse. The water's rising. A helicopter comes by, drops a ladder. And he's like, no, it's okay. Go save someone else. God's going to save me. I'm good, right? I'm praying, right? I'm, I'm going to be saved. And then he gets, of course, the flood takes him out and he dies, right? And he ends up in heaven or in front of God. And he's like, hey, dude, like, you know, what's up? You let me die. I, you know, I've been worshiping and praying to you my whole life and you just let me go under. And he's like, so what does God say? So, well, I gave you a radio broadcast and I sent a boat, man, and I got even a helicopter to come by and you just ignored it, right? So, you know, and, and that's very, very profound because how many people, in it's an world, old story, but a good one. Yeah. Have this attitude that there's someone that's going to come and save them. This is something that you and I have talked about quite extensively. This idea of the others, the white hats are someone other than us, that they're going to come rolling into town and fix things. Or, you know, there's going to be some kind of a savior coming. And this is a deeply entrenched mentality in a lot of people, even to this day. And it's again represented in this film very clearly with this so she's the only one really that um you know then she's at that point there's a turn in her character where she's like you know what i'm not waiting anymore i think she even has that line doesn't she in the yes. film yes she does right and then she takes off right and uh so they're looking for her and she's gone and it's her that actually finds like the actual solution to that problem meanwhile you know the adults are panicking looking around there's that whole scene with the neighbor and the getting the medicine and you know the the, the prepper and the the women you know the the uh, the daughter and the mother the, the black man's daughter and the mother played by julia roberts they end up in the shed being surrounded by this great i got a great screenshot here i mean they are surrounded by the deer right <laughs> ai deer AI deer, of course. Yeah. And they're coming up to them. And how do they react? Like you see them in the middle, right? Screaming their heads off, right? Like panicking and screaming at nature, trying to shoot them away, right? They're, that's just a clear example how out of touch nature's there to tell them something. They came and told the daughter something. She saw it. She told them about it. They didn't care, right? And now they do, they themselves have their profound experience with nature, with the deer, symbolized by the, as you say, reindeer. What is that? Christmas, right? Um, showing up in the film and, you know, they, they chase them off. You know, they freak out. They well, they're completely scared of the deer. They're like completely, completely scared. Instead of going up and hugging them or, or petting them or something, or just thinking, wow, what an amazing moment, right? No, they... They panic, absolute panic. Uh, there's, there's this for me. There's this progression in the movie where they, everybody realizes throughout the movie things get worse and worse and worse. There's this piercing sound that lasts for 10, 15 seconds that just is almost killing them in terms of pain, and then it subsides. Um, and and so there is this progression of okay, they're realizing something really big is happening. Like this is not gonna get back to normal. And like you say, Rose, the 13-year-old daughter goes, I'm not waiting any longer. She kind of just disappears, walks into this house that she had seen uh, on, on, you know, on the edge of the woods and actually finds a fully functional, high-tech, uh, super-rich bunker. And her only quest in that bunker war and, and throughout the movie was to finally watch the last episode of the TV show Friends. Uh, so this was her thing. All she wanted to do throughout this whole movie was to watch that. But she ends up, because she said, I'm not going to wait anymore. I'm going to do something. She ends up wandering through that bunker. It's basically taken care of and watches that episode that they had a, a DVD there. Exactly. And Christine said she is uh, beautifully, because I didn't see, you know, it didn't really occur to me. But she said, Christine said, this is the message for people is stop waiting. You got to do something. You got to. You, you got to take action and be uh, proactive, right? So that little girl, in in the sense, as creepy as she was, she really turned out to be the only sane character in the story. 
<laughs> right, absolutely. And it's sad, John, because then what does she do when she gets to the house? She gorges herself on junk food. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, it's like not like, oh, my God, I found a supply of food. We might need this. Let's be conservative. No, let's let's just stuff our faces with, you know, everything that's like unhealthy. And then we'll go and sit this last watch this last episode of Friends, which ironically, the one of the actors from Friends, I think, recently died. One of the main characters. Yeah. Matthew Perry. He, he, Matthew he... Perry. Right. So everyone's watching Friends again. Coincidence. Right. That exactly at that time, this movie would come out. That's talking about. And the last I think the the episode in question even was called the last one. I think the timing of his death pretty much. I was when the movie was dropped. It was just around the same days. It's cra It's a crazy coincidence. Another great coincidence. Like we know the simulation, right? John, what is the simulation and what is reality? <laughs> it's, there's only one way to discern and there's no physical sense that we have to do that. Uh, that we can't do it. We got to go deeper. There was one line in the movie that to me, I, I as I was thinking about the movie is, the bits and pieces were kind of the, the bits and pieces that matter were kind of spread out so that you have to go back and combine them maybe retroactively. But the owner of the house, he said, nothing frightens me more than a person unwilling to learn even at their own expense. That to me was the sentence of the movie. If you really, how many signs can we get that something is going in the wrong direction. How much can we see and realize and still ignore because we want to be comfortable, ignorant, oblivious, even if it's to our detriment, right? Like you say, you just keep going to McDonald's, keep stuffing your uh, bad foods into your body, keep watching shit, keep drinking, whatever. Nothing frightens me more than a person unwilling to learn, even at their own expense, because guess what? It's going to be at our, our uh, collective expense. And that to me is a positive takeaway. We got to learn from what we're watching, right? Like when we look at 2023, Frank, the year, what are you kind of your takeaways from uh, this extremely eventful year? Unlike any year I can remember other than the COVID era. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the big themes was kind of summarized really well. Like the other night I, I was, um, you know, in 2003, I picked up an iPod and I started to listen to something called podcasts back then, which was a new novelty, right? One of the first ones that I checked out was one called Infinite Smile, which was uh, a podcast by an American Zen master called Michael McAllister. And I get this email a couple a week ago or a couple days ago that said, you know, it's been 20 years and he's calling it the last episode is going to happen and it's now Zoom, right? So... He was saying farewell. So I, I had to get, he was having it at a time. It was like 4 a.m. my time. And it was funny because at 4 a.m. I kind of got up and I was awake. I'm like, well, you know, it's 4 a.m. Maybe I should go check out Michael McAlter's final podcast, right? And, and just sort of send my kudos to him because I respect the man and what he's brought to the world. And one of the messages that he that he put out, I think was really powerful and symbolizes kind of that, that question of what I, what I've, learned or felt a lot this year or, or been reminded of this year is this idea of you know and i think the characterization you have given it is this npc thing you went into that quite deeply this year and um you know we talked about it a little bit together and on the periphery what this to me means is you know the npcs represent kind of the perspective of the ego that that is um in the zen sense it is it lives in the past, you know, it, it has memories of the past and it glorifies the past or it, it pulls its experience from the past as its representation of what the future will be. And if those experiences in the past were based on, you know, um, chaos or fear or problems, then, you know, because because let's face it, I mean, most people's lives are driven by e ego and the inner voices. And it's there's always a problem. You know, the ego wants to be in charge and it manifests these problems. So it's never in the now. It projects into the future what these problems might be. So the ego based egocentric person who's not checking their inner dialogue, they're going to be living from the, the input, the feedback that's logged in their brains and they're going to project it into the future. But they're not going to there's one thing that's missing and that is the present you know whereas the 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 bigger 
um, self in the Zen sense, again, I'm reflecting here on McAllister's podcast, is this part that lives in the now, that is taking into account what's really going on, like really what's happening right in front of you and seeing it for what it really is, instead of projecting the past into it or the future onto it. And this is something that I've seen this year a lot. A lot of people are you know, they're scrambling for answers because this was one of the years where I think the information density began to increase exponentially. Well, and they released Chad GPT on the world, so that helped with the Chat GPT and, and, and you know, and like you know, we talked about um, you know, some of these other AI influenced um, like Operation Jigsaw and all these things that Google has planned, which are taking um AI and utilizing algorithms to program again following right into the npc dialogue you know the accepted mainstream dialogues and and words and keywords and key phrases into the algorithm of ai which is, does a much better job perusing the internet chat rooms twitters and whatever facebooks and seeing identifying those words and those phrases and then quickly tagging them and uh, and the and the result of that tagging is of course to take things that are of meaning or that are potentially outside of the dialogue of the mainstream which is desired by the planners let's call them that um, and pushing them down out of the search results in the case of google and and uh, in the case of social media making them unfavorable so that those people who are expressing those ideas and those words and dialogues are tainted you know with a with an, an um, you know a flag, you could say, of being naysayers, negative conspiracy theorists, rebels, dangers to this normal normidom, um, and 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 then what happens is that you get all these people that would rather be safe, they'd rather retain their accounts, so they begin to adopt this stuff subconsciously, and so this year for me was like kind of like a key a key year for deciding for many people to decide like are you going to join the massive wave that is leading us to the tsunami that's called transhumanism for the sake of convenience, for the sake of you want to maintain your friendships, for the sake of not pushing any buttons because of the irritation it causes to your life. Um, you know, all these things, like even the idea of cash and things like that. You know, we talked a lot about that, and this is a reality. There's things coming down the pipeline like digital central banking digital currencies cbdc's as they're known which is going to take away a certain amount of the sovereignty so we've got this division starting now very very clearly i mean it's been starting obviously a long time back it's had a long run but it's gotten to the point now where we're looking at a, a clear division between those who want to maintain their consciousness at the highest level and manifest we've been talking about timelines a timeline which is the optimal expression of the organic, highly evolved human tapping into and accessing their own inner biocomputers, the, their biology hardware. The, the bio hardware that we have built into our bodies is able to enable us to manifest anything that an AI world could. But we have to make an investment in that and we have to work at that. Whereas the other timeline is that transhumanist timeline, which is making it you know harder and harder for us to stay stay focused on the timeline that's maybe a little bit harder to work on because we have to be disciplined we have to maintain our sovereignty and we have to say no so this is this year for me marked really the start of that um in a very profound way and i, I have nothing to expect other than in the next year this is going to become deeper and deeper of a divide and i think we even showed i know you want to jump in i'll just add one yeah, more we, we showed that uh, that Fibonacci spiral versus the crystal spiral as an example of how there's been these timelines running in parallel and then they're connecting, right? I think the date that the people that were putting that information out there was somewhere in, around the beginning of eight or, eight or nine of November. And after that, it's like the timelines are going to begin to split. And so now it's like the time was this year was the time to kind of make that decision in your heart and in your consciousness and using you know, those faculties that you have, those extended faculties to really make that commitment. You know, based on what you just shared and what we discussed previously, and if you look at mathematics and uh, periods of development, because 
often when we when we go on and we share what we think will happen in the near future, and oftentimes these are we're we're seeing big scenarios on both ends of the spectrum. But there's a reason for that. This is not uh, fantasy. The longer a development period uh, takes, right, and both these uh, periods, the awakening, if you will, and the transhumanist timeline. If, if I mean, this is this is uh, very um, um, how do you call it? Not bipolar, but it is bipolar actually. Um, Schizophrenic. <laughs> well, but but these are kind of the two mainstreams. But the longer a period of development takes, the more exponential and faster the development. That's why technology has developed so incredibly fast in the last years, to our knowledge. Of course, it's faster than that in the hidden. But so the exponentiality, the longer a development takes, the faster and the broader it it expands. And that is that is mathematically explainable. Same thing with the awakening, by the way. So that's why we see these extremes and polarities. And while we talk about timelines, we might say we're drifting back and forth between different realities. And we literally are because there are these simulations within the simulations. And oftentimes we don't know what affects what. So that, you know, those are those are confusing concepts. But I think, you know, I'm looking at this buffalo. There's a buffalo here. There's buffaloes all around me. Uh, we love buffaloes. The North American buffalo. And there's a there's a tradition, a story among the American Indians, the Native Americans, what the buffalo is known for. The only animal, when the storm front approaches, all other animals run away from the storm. And of course, that that's a that's a trying task because you have to run, and the faster the storm goes, the faster you have to run, and then you're there, you're running from it for a long time, and when it catches up with you, you have to deal with the storm. The buffalo, as the only animal, turns around and walks right through the storm, uh, faces the challenge head on, and minimizes the time that it's going to spend in the storm. And so we have these reminders. When Christine and I discovered the story, what my wife always does is she made sure we internalize it, we embody it, we see it every day. So there's buffaloes all around our house. So we're reminded of when a challenge presents itself, go head on, face it now. And I think that's where we're at. That there is no more escape. You know, there's no more sitting it out. There's no more waiting it out. Whatever the challenge is in your life, the decision you have to make, the stuff you have to fix, you heal. I think we have to face it head on. And 2024 will, it will be, in my view, exponentially good and better for those who have done it and who are doing it, and exponentially worse for those who are fighting it still and not wanting to go there. Do you kind of see that too in, in observing people? Yes, I do. I absolutely see that. And a lot of what you're saying is I, I see that everywhere. And both, you know, Tanya and myself see it as well. We've, we've traveled a lot this year and you know, it just seems to me um, that it is like a, I believe it's a, it is a natural cycle, you might say. And I don't know if, um, if I shared this with you or not, I don't actually recall now, but did I tell you, talk about the, um, the invite that we had to Hopi land this year? Yes, you shared, yeah. I don't know if you shared it on camera or privately though. Right, right. So, I mean, I, I, it's, it, that to me was again, symbolizing, um, what you're talking about too, it's like where we have to make a decision and being the Buffalo and walking into the storm. One of the things that came to mind while you were talking about is that, you know, how often um, you have, I faced a problem and, and, and my imagination can get the better of me. I can begin to think, Oh my God, you know, like some letter comes or some government thing or whatever it form it takes. Right. And you begin to think, Oh, this is horrible. This is going to be bad. And what happens is that when you just face it and deal with it, it actually turns out usually to be a not nearly as bad or have not nearly as nasty a bite as you thought it did. And so the, the idea of the buffalo facing, um, they probably learned in their evolution that, hey, you know, you go through a bit of like, you know, hail and, you know, whatever, lightning and stuff, and then it will, you know, pound you, but then it's over. And you know the one of, and i guess the the native americans had the closest relationship to those animals before they were essentially pushed to the brink of extinction by the invading europeans and being this year we were in sedona tanya managed to organize a um 
a tour of Hopi land for us. We had a, a shaman who took us on the land and took us right to Prophecy Rock. And, uh, you know, at the time I was looking rare at honor, it. by the way, right? Pardon me? That's a rare honor, by the way. It, it is, and especially now because after we, we found out after a very few weeks after we were there, the rock was vandalized heavily, and now nobody is going to go back there uh, for a long time probably, right? And um, if, you know, and then, so I, when I came back and, and the, the shaman who gave us the, the talk about what the symbolism was on the, on the uh, prophecy rock, I, and I was just, I had to chuckle and smile because it was like, again, I might, I might have a picture of it here. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. Here we go. This is, um, this is Thomas Banyakya. He was, he was the previous former uh, kind of ambassador of the Hopi elders. And he has a, a copy of what's drawn on the Hopi rock on this canvas that he carried around and, and when in his travels, he no, he's no longer alive. He died in 1999, but there's some very profound things on the information that he put out. And I, I just wanted to share this with you because, um, you know, on the one hand I was, you know, you, you can see the two timelines, the top timeline represents the modern man, uh, the four, you know, major uh, inventions like the wheel, you know, um, you know, computers, to flight, and automobile, and stuff like that. And the bottom one has circles that represent major uh, Earth-changing events, man-made events like the wars. Those two circles are considered the First and Second World War. And then there's a line where they essentially connect on the far right. And then on the upper one, at that point, there's a zigzag that goes off into chaos. And the lower one, there's another circle. And then there's this being there, which is Masao. He's the creator being, and he's waiting for the Hopis to get through the last big test. And that alone in itself was amazing because it was tying in a lot of the, um, the the prophetic or the information that was coming out with respect to looking glass material that, that I was exploring for the last year and a half. So I had to laugh because of that alone. But if you look at that picture at the top left and right, there are two symbols there. And on the left part, there's a symbol with a circle around it that represents the masculine. And on the right, there's a symbol that represents the feminine. And what he's saying is that the balance between masculine and feminine needs to be maintained for the world to stay, obviously, in balance. And again, this year was a year where we saw a lot of this whole transgenderism go off the charts, right? But where I'm going with this is that I had to, like, just a few weeks ago, Tanya and I were invited to a very, very special place. In fact, it was the, it was the, place where the Templar order was founded over a thousand years ago and we were actually in the building in the basement that you know this basement goes back to the times of the Romans and I was looking at the walls and I'll show you some of what we saw there you know it's like what do you see on the walls of the Templars from you know 900 or a thousand years ago right Look at those symbols, John. Yep. Right? They've, so they've been thinking, inverted, perverted, but they've been around for a very long time. And I'm thinking to myself, like, why, you know, what, what Banyakia was saying was that the those two symbols are, are, are what's on the shakers that are, that are used by the Hopis in their ceremonies with respect to the prophecy. And they've had them for 900 years. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, 900 years. How did the Hopi get the Templar symbols on their shaker? <laughs> 400 years before white man supposedly even came over to the continent, according to the official version of history, right? So we're touring around in this place. And uh, what do we see? A painting. Yeah, I'll show you this. On the wall in one of the stories of this building. And what is that showing? That's showing a squash plant, you see? And you're thinking, yeah, so what, right? Well, um, you know, problem is that that painting has been carbon dated to over a thousand years old. So, um, you know, excuse me, like, or 900 years, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense because you would think, okay, to a normal person, it's only a painting of a squash. Well, if, you, if you're anybody that knows anything about horticulture, you realize that squash was brought from North America to Europe 500 years later after the date of this actual painting on the wall. 
So some interesting things started going around in my mind, like, hmm. <laughs> Does this they... actually surprise you in any way anymore? No, not anymore, because I've been digging around in, in, in this teleportation, you know, project looking glass and all this weird stuff. Everyone thinks is woo woo. They don't want to believe this technology is real. Well, here I was in the basement that goes back a thousand years ago. And the the Templar order had actually developed ultraviolet technology, John. Right. Even though, you know, ultraviolet like disco light technology, where did they get it from? Well, they developed it and there's evidence of it on the walls in this place. and there again is the symbols, right? You would think like, wow, you know, okay, what does that mean? Well, it basically means that they had technology that was far and above maybe what we think they were able to manage or deal with way back then. And this technology somehow allowed them some form of communication across, was it time or was it distance? Right. So these are some big questions that come up. And I just wanted to mention that because it was really kind of um, miraculous in a way. And, and, the, and the thing that you learned about the founder of the order, his name is Stephen Harding. He used to be the head of the order of the Druids. And he decided to leave the Druidic order because of corruption and join the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I'm not sure, you know, that was the best move, you know. <laughs> but what's interesting is that his fascination was with the the Bible, and he wanted to figure out what was the, um, can we, can he get his hand on the original Christian Aramaic documents and compare the writings in those original Christian Gnostic documents with what is written in the Bible? And during that time, of course, if you think back, what was going on during that time? It was the Crusades, right? So there was a lot of pilgrimage going on. And they actually found archives under certain temples in the Middle East. And Harding found out about that. And he managed to get his hands on documents that were these early Christian writings, bring them back to the location we were sitting at. And he, he found that there were Sufi mystics that were alive who could understand, they still understand the Aramaic language, but also knew Latin. And that was his language. So he had this these original documents translated from Aramaic Christian documents into into Latin, and he then could see if they matched up with the Christian Bible, right? And what happened? Guess what? Discrepancies. Big discrepancies. <laughs> Big discrepancies, right? And so he took that information and he wrote what's called the New Bible, and he presented it to the Pope. I think it was Pope Augustus. And Augustus said, wow, this is awesome. Thank you very much. You can go, right? And what happened to the Bible? Well, we all know nothing happened to the Bible. It's been buried. In fact, there's only three copies of this Bible in the world right now. Um, but what's interesting is that one of the things that he found in the teachings that was um, that blew my mind is that these original um, Gnostic Christians, they knew about the wave structure of matter. And, and they... A, um, they described it in the way that we would maybe think of, an, of a very early form of the idea of reincarnation in that souls are made up of the matter or, or the of the energy of the whole universe. And when you become a body and enter into the world and your soul ventures into this reality, you take a piece of that universe with you and you make all these experience in the world. And at the end of your life, you return back to the universe, what you've gathered and you give it back to the whole. And so the next, you know, embodiments of that universe bring that information with them into the body, into the physical flesh. And so this is essentially exactly what is being described in Wave Structure of Matters. I was talking about to you when we talked about the Inner Looking Glass webinar, that the electron is the storage place as the repository for all gathered knowledge and information in the world. So where am I going with this? We have the Templars a thousand years ago, and we have the Hopis sharing symbology, where they both tuning in, using their pineal gland, using their higher senses, right? Because we know that the medicine man, what did they all have on their heads? They had feathers. And where did those feathers point? At the pineal gland, which means they, had, they were well aware of the power of this bio hardware that we have in our bodies to be able to tune in to these other dimensions. So the information that these Christians had written down was essentially saying that everything is stored. And in their terminology, it was in the universe. 
but nonetheless, it's stored in the field and we can prove that. And so all these devices like the looking glass or the chronovisor or the Orion's cube and all these different forms of it, all they're doing is they're, they're a technology that is tapping using you know crystal uh, geometry, using very finely tuned and highly sensitive magnetite crystals, for example, to tune in these other dimensional informations and make them visible, make them presentable, just like our pineal gland does. So very, very powerful information um, with, you know, with respect to what we have as proof that our bodies are capable of much more than we've yet manifested. And so I think, you know, in summary, looking at last year and this division between this chaos and this absolute decision making, like, do you um, want to follow this artificial timeline to its ultimate transhumanist end where you lose sovereignty or do you want to become aware and tune into that what you have within your own body to tune into these other dimensions. Now is the time to make that decision because it's going to start getting kind of hairy. You know, um, Frank, you just you just went into this multi-dimensional explanation of something that I think uh, people that go a little bit more in a scientific uh, route of thinking, right? I think it's important that there is an explanation for what you're sharing, and really. I think that's what you did. And I want to get to that in a moment. And then we're going to go to the Q&A because I know people are waiting to ask questions. Um, basically, in very simple terms, my friends, what Frank is saying to you, and we're echoing this message every day, is you have to tune to a part inside of you that isn't really visible. It's not something that you can you can use parts of your body like the pineal gland. This is an, it's, it's the antenna, if you will. It's, it's a gateway but you're tuning into something that you can't see and yet it contains everything that is. And in a, in a time where the outer reality presents itself in maximum confusion on purpose, by the way, on purpose, a lot of confusion, those who tune within, they make the choices that are most beneficial to them and all that is. And I think that's kind of what we have been seeing. And I want to just point to one man that made such a decision uh, and that's the guy over here, Frank Jacob. I, I was just thinking about it. I mean, you've been a filmmaker. Uh, you've been part of some some really, really great movies. But the way that you have entered the realm uh, in 2022 was a new was a new way. It was a new path. Um, I think you've expressed yourself in, in different ways and you've done it in different ways. But you wrote an article that you were inspired to write about the, these guardians of the looking glass. And I know when I read the article, I know you were deeply excited and inspired about what that could possibly mean and entail. I happened to just be inspired and intuitively guided to read that article. And because I know who the platform owner is, I immediately, which I rarely do, I called him up, said, I gotta, I gotta talk to this Frank Jacob guy. He's onto something. And boom, a few days later, we did our first interview. And Frank, you have reached millions and millions and millions of people since in the last two years. It's crazy. In another way that you've reached them before, and those important, essential, foundational messages are reaching so many people, and they're sharing them with others, and they're implementing them. So this is the expansion, uh, ex exponentiality of uh, following guidance and intuition that comes from a much deeper space. The reason why I shared this story is because the potential for something like this is in all of us. It's not just, uh, you know, Frank Jacobs, not the, the singled out one. It's in all of us to express ourselves in the way that we were designed to express ourselves in order to do what's most beneficial for us and everybody else. And so I think that to me is the greatest message moving forward is that we have to dig deeper with that and, and do what we're guided to do in the deepest sense and that that will have an, a wonderful positive effect on, on the whole. So I want to thank you for following your guidance. And, uh, you know, I so enjoy these conversations that we're having over and over again. And if if you didn't have anything else scheduled, Frank, I'd like to open the floor for Q&A for people that want to uh, ask questions, unless you want to share something else before that. No, no, I think I didn't really have a plan. You know, I just had a few notes or whatever. <laughs> Like, which I haven't actually even looked at. So I'll just put them away. And I think we covered, you know, what I wanted to. I made some slides so we could talk about it just off the visuals. 
and you know we could probably talk about it for hours but i think we covered the essence of what what is really going on here um and you know i think important for people i think with respect to the subject matter we've talked about earlier at the beginning of our talk today uh i think the message is important to remember that even though they're presenting the idea of a cyber attack and we know the wef is planning this kind of stuff and they simulate this kind of stuff that it's important to stay grounded and not be led by the nose you know by some so many people are just led from one media barrage to the to the next uh and and i'm and i'm very aware that there's even people in the alternative media who are you know you'd say guilty of of being you know having the assignment of you know expanding the panic out there or whatever um without a without a spiritual perspective and i think one of the things i like about i love about the talks that you and i have i'm so glad that you did tune in that day is that we've always been able to kind of turn it uh, we've been able to look at these crazy, you know, things going on, but we've kind of put a um, a holistic and spiritual spin on them, not in a not in an orthodox or conformist way, but in a way that this is the information we have available to navigate the space that we're in, and and we're open to exploring wherever it leads and and talking about it at a, at a higher density of information. You know, like the Hawkins scale was talking about how. You know, people have reached this 200 and this, that's this, the courage, right? Courage is the point where, you know, at the point of courage is the first time you actually can put your foot down and say, I have the courage to say no or to go against the grain. And everything goes up from there toward enlightenment. And so, you know, I, I think it's it's been an honor and offer, opportunity to really kind of use this media we have while we still have it to to bring that level or that frequency into the discussion i think you know maybe that's something that is a chemistry thing because i don't see it in many other places and i'm happy that we can share it in that way oh man same here we're it's so interesting like sometimes we won't talk for a month or so and then we uh and then we just find ourselves at the exact same uh place observing the same things and coming to similar conclusions uh, frank here's a first question for you from robert uh, could we, Robert, by the way, it's a great hat. Love it, man. Here's one of the white hats. Could we address the overarching fear aspects to all this? Like, how important is it to deny the fear and the control it seeks type of vibe may be? Uh, Frank, what do you make of that question? And I mean, it, it addresses what you just said, the fear, kind of the fear factor. What do you think? Well, I think that I mean, the first thing that comes to mind, um, thanks for the question, Robert, is is that fear is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, we were given adrenaline and we were given the emotion of fear to get ourselves out of a tight spot. I mean, if you're having a, you know, it probably goes way back to you know, when we were primitive tribes, you're, you know, you're sitting at a stream and you're drinking from the stream and there's like a tiger or something, uh, you know, uh, across the stream from you well maybe that's a good time to become afraid because the fear will charge your adrenaline you'll you'll turn around and you'll dart out of there and you'll save your your butt whereas if you were just like oh it's only a tiger i mean chances are you know if you're evolved as a spiritual master you might be able to link up with the tiger telepathically and he might just walk away but better be on the safe side and i think that fear in that sense in its rawest form serves a purpose but even that form of fear is only temporary because once the the element of danger is is passed you can return to normal and i think that the dangerous part of fear is that when people let their emotions of the, their emotions get the better of them and they become fear centric because they look at the world out there um as something which is um a danger to them and to their family and to their minds and whatever and you can become obsessed with that so you know, I think here we should take the example of the buffalo and we should face the fear head on. And I think when you do face the fear um, and, and a, in a rational, calm way, in a sense that, you, you know, whatever calmness you have in a moment of emotionality, you'll still be able to make a more informed decision about what the best plan of action would be the next moment rather than just hysterically freaking out. You know, as a practical, quickly to add to Frank's great answer here is um, when you use conscious techniques like breathing, when you consciously breathe 10 deep breaths into the fear, honestly, you breathe into it. You don't try to breathe it away. You breathe into it. 
because fear for the most part is a signal from the body. And oftentimes, like Frank says, it's, it's archaic. It doesn't really represent the current threat level that's out there. When you breathe into it, it tends to subside because the body can't sustain it. I wouldn't say deny fear. Anything you deny comes back stronger. Never, never try to push something away. Transmute, transmutation is really the key here that you work through it. So then it's, it doesn't become an issue along the way. But I want to say one thing. Uh, you can only be triggered when you're loaded. So to, to, to constantly say that others are uh, scaring you or they're putting out information that is fearful. What we talked about here today to some might be to some very fearful. But we talked about facts that are out there that you cannot deny they are there. However, your programming was or your pain is you will re re react fearfully or you will say, well, that inspires me to become even better. But the signal that you're getting from your body tells you really, really clearly something about you, not the situation, usually, because most people are not in a life or death situation every day. So when the fear comes up, ask yourself, what is it signaling to me? What is it telling me? When else did I feel this way? So you can get to the bottom of it, because that's more powerful than trying to uh, not look at it in my, in my perception, just to add to the, your answer. Frank KS says, can Frank elaborate where does our soul stand in all this pineal gland and consciousness evolution? Where is the role of the soul in all this as the soul is uh, at the center of our body? Well, I mean, this is a this is a very philosophical question, and it's answered in many different ways depending on where your spiritual place is moment at the moment. The way I see it is I see myself not as a body that is has developed consciousness but i may see, see myself as consciousness that is using a body as a form of expression so for me the soul is that higher level of consciousness from which the source is that i connected from so i'm you know coming out of the field of higher awareness by choice into a matrix you know a matrix is just a word for another reality another form of reality so and in order to express and learn to interact with other souls in physical bodies. I mean, that's kind of like the, you could say that we are like the, our bodies, like the embodiment of the Garden of Eden concept that the creator sent us here to be able to experience the body and experience one another and interact with one another on this physical body sensory level in order to expand um, you know, the, what the creator itself is, you know, that we are all in, but endowed with this creative ability as creators so that we are here together co-creating this reality. And I think that for me, the soul level of consciousness is the one where you realize that we're not just here to pursue material things, but we're actually here to be spirits within these bodies to pursue that plan. That original plan has not yet been manifested here. We're still obsessed with materialism we're still distracted with things that keep us from tuning into the to the sensory perception that we actually have inherently built right into our bodies. Some people say, like Descartes, that the soul is seated in the pineal gland, you know, that that's the seed of the soul. And that he looked at the body as being made up of all these controllers, and the controllers were relatively tiny compared to what they're controlling. There's a controller in your heart as well, in the left ventricle, a tiny little pea-sized organ which runs your heart. If that little controller gets taken out, it doesn't matter how big your body is, you're pretty much over. And it's the same with the pineal gland. The pineal gland is the transducer of higher levels of consciousness into the physical. It's actually literally a transducer, which means it turns signals into pictures working together with something called the hippocampus. So the soul is expressed through our body. And I think the idea is to get back to soul consciousness in the perception that we're not just a, we're not just the body, but B, the fact that we have these bodies is a miracle. And we, we have to stop, you know, um, I think one of the things that I've noticed a lot in the world is this, people are down on humanity, you know, like humans are this and humans are bad and humans only pollute or humans are doing all this. Well, yes, the unconscious version of humans is. But the fact is we're sentient beings. We're the highest expression of the creator in as far as humanity is concerned so we're not sinners we're not you know we're not bad we're just 
out of phase and out of touch with the soul level of consciousness. I guess that that's the best way I could answer it. Thank you, Frank. That's very, very brilliantly answered. Uh, Daniela Johnson is asking, in your knowledge, is it possible to add nanotechnology in food to alter our mind? Frank, it's like she heard our pre-conversation, right? Uh, yeah, yeah good it, question. Far, yeah. Or could it be a possibility? I'm not even kidding you. Frank actually brought this very subject up in our pre-convo before we came live. Frank. Well, yeah, what you're talking about here with nanotechnology is something that has been expressed in various, um, yeah, what do you call them? Just, you know, chat groups and organizations that are forming, um, that are, you know, building um, conspiratorial concepts about the world. And not that conspiracies in themselves or conspiratorial thinking is bad in and of itself. But the idea that there's um, mRNA technology or let's say nanotechnology in food as something coming or something that is going to be introduced, I'm sad to say it, it's already way past beyond us. Okay, it's already in our bodies. We are full of this stuff. And one of the things that I didn't really get into in our last episode, but which is clear, is that they began making biosensors, sensors lodged within your body starting in 1956. Okay, so how much, how many years have passed since then? We're almost at what, 70 years later? Um, we're talking about technology which has developed smaller and made smaller and smaller and smaller so that it's now where, you know, even the WEF has quotes about the new age is about edibles, right? Edible things that you can put. It's all about sensors in the body. That can be used. So I'm sorry to say this. It might come as a shock to many people, but we are full by now of these sensors. And so, you know, that in and of itself is probably you know something which could make a lot of people go panic, but I think we should just confront the fact that it's there. And one of the things that I always wish we would do more is we would talk more about that technology because that technology is very real. There's patents on it that are out on the internet. I've discussed it. I talk about it in my webinars at great length. Um, and this technology is there to assist this, you know, you could say this AI version of consciousness to be able to enter into our realm and we talk about timeline wars well you could say that this idea of nanotechnology is embodied in the idea of a timeline war and that we carry within our body the technology which can cut us off from the timeline we want to be on the organic timeline utilizing those bio hardware sensors that we have in our body and filling it and replacing it with these artificial versions of sensors that can communicate with using 5G and 6G and whatever other coming technology and Starlink and whatever they're going to be called in order to be able to yeah, per perhaps even control our thoughts. So being aware of that is the first step in learning to, you know, to question what's going on in the universe healthily to, you know, to have, um, you know, deductive reasoning and, you know, basically to be able to look at what's going on and navigate the world a little bit more with a little bit more skepticism and to look into this technology. Because I think the way out of this technology is to recognize that it's there, to confront the creators of this technology, ask them what the plan is and where they're wanting to go and making that public on a very, very wide scale, as wide scale as possible. Because I think this is a decision that many people didn't make. They've become subject to having biosensors in their bodies, and they never gave permission for these things to be put in there, but they're there. So now we're at a stage where we're beyond, you know, it being in our body. Yep, it's there. Okay, let's deal with it. But the dealing with it is the part where we face the storm and we go, okay, what is this stuff now? Here's some, you know, films. Here's some diagrams of this technology in action. You know, we showed some of them on our shows that we've done together. So we want to talk to the people who are, the decision makers we've given the power to in the politics or in science and put them on the hot seat, make them explain what this stuff is. And basically that will lead to solutions as to how to remove that stuff from our bodies. If that's what you desire, because of course, if that's what you desire, we have to leave room for the free will of some people who might think it's totally cool to become locked up or linked up with, the cyber world and enter that, you know, transhumanist reality. But that's not necessarily what everybody wants to do. Yeah, that's, uh, I want to add one aspect to this that I hear um, from all sides of, of people that are studying this. There is an antidote 
and and Frank has pointed to that. The only viable antidote is uh, elevated consciousness to this. There's, if you do not have that, there is no physical thing that you can co co that you can do to counteract all these measures. We've been too complacent for too long, but the consciousness is exponential and infinite uh, in its expression. So. The solutions that come from higher consciousness, we cannot anticipate until we reach states of higher consciousness. That's why this conversation also around the pineal gland, around this development and the raising of consciousness is in the view of almost all of us now, the most important conversation, because from that level, we can deal with this. From the level of fear, from the level of, of, of what the AI represents, we cannot, that's an unwinnable war. So that's at least my perspective on this. It is all in the consciousness. Thank Great you. Answer. Silicon Valley girl, uh, creative spelling. I love it. Are higher density beings helping us wake up? Is the Hopi prophecy going to end in our ascension and not in the alternative doom path? <laughs> you, want, you want the small answer, Silicon Valley girl. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, please. Well, you know, please let us know. Are we doomed or are we ascended? Well, okay, I mean, I'll build on what you just said about higher information, right? I, and everything that I've learned in the last couple of years of digging deeply into this subject matter is that everything's based on resonance. And so the question about our higher density beings helping us wake up, it has a lot to do with what you just said. When we begin to wake up ourselves, when we begin to elevate our consciousness from thoughts that are not just you know on lower planes of of reality but in dealing with the finer things that some people call the 5d or the new world or whatever we begin to change our frequency and we actually go into resonance with other similar like-minded individuals and what happens is you know people break away that are you you know a lot of what it means to get to a higher place means you might have to make decisions about what's around you in your life. This is a part of looking at what's really there. And if you're finding that there are people in your life that are kind of pulling you down with their, you know, their laundry and their dirty laundry and their diatribes and everything that they're keeping you down with, when you, you find that by making the decision to begin to wake up, those people begin to not want to hang out with you because they can't handle your resonance. They can't handle your frequency. So you fall out of resonance with them and you fall into resonance with like-minded others that begin to attract into your life. And so my answer to that question is, why would that end on any level? I mean, there's, of course, there's higher density. There's beings that are a much higher frequency. There must be, okay, because there's higher levels of human consciousness. And why would it end there? And the fact is, we know that it goes out into the field and that we feel that, that our bodies extend outward up to four meters physically into that field and that we actually connect with the magnetosphere of the Earth itself, which is also kind of a repository We've had Michael Persinger talk brilliantly on that in our film Solar Revolution about how the, that's the field that we deposit everything into. And so these higher beings, of course, they would be there. They would be tuning in. We would automatically connect with them. Now, are they going to land here in your neighborhood and get out of their silver saucers with their laser guns and say, we're taking over? We're here to rescue you? I don't think that that's consistent with the doctrine of free will and the idea that we have to allow people to make the mistakes and we have to allow us to also ask for, you know, we have to ask for that intervention. We have to, meaning we have to go into humility and realize that we may not help have all the answers. So when you begin to ask those questions and some people do it through prayer and other people do it through meditation and other people, whatever way, everyone's got their own way of doing it. But when you begin to do that, you actually pull those higher beings into your field and you begin to communicate with them. They give you messages. They give you information. They express themselves in the material world through the craziest, wildest ways. That could mean suddenly you're seeing you have a question and you see, you know, license plates with the exact same number sequence pass by three times in a row. It's almost like the universe is saying, yes, we heard you. So there's things you have to look for and there's things you can find around you, which are a representation of those higher beings that are here to wake us up. Now, as far as the Hopi prophecy, um, you know, they they themselves, and, and Banyakya talks about how, you know, he goes deep into what those symbols mean, and he also actually connects them to a people. 
And we all know who those people who use those symbols are, right? And um, maybe people don't want to hear that, but he talks about how they shook the world up twice. And they did. The First and Second World Wars involved that Germanic people, which tend to embody that symbology. And he talks about how the third time around, they're going to come here and they're going to be like um, the sky is going to rain down. They're going to land and, and from like having breakfast from one day to the next, the whole country will have been basically taken over. So the question is, what does that mean? Does that mean aliens are going to land and take over? Does that mean, does that symbolize our higher consciousness is going to wake up where people are just going to get in tune with who they really are when it comes down to it? Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but he saw that and he talks about it in their prophecy and the um, the line, the squiggly line at the top, is a line that represents the chaos of the world that is going to be experienced by those who follow that path, that artificiality, that transhumanist path, the technocratic world, that will lead to, you could say, their destruction. And the other path is the one that leads past that last great event to meeting up and, and uh, making a connection with the original creator who now would be ready to actually embrace them and join with them to become like their new leader, or in a sense, lead them with the philosophy or the higher state of consciousness. So the Hopi said that both are possible, and it's still not written in stone, because they talked about how if we don't see the way, then there's going to be from the West coming on shore, so many multitudes of uh, people that are going to destroy what is left of the material world. So they saw that as well. Now, can prophecies change? I'm one that tends to believe that prophecies um, can also be, you know, have to be regarded with some skepticism because they could also be a form of programming that is being utilized by the cabal to then, you know, jump on us and throw us things that we then say, oh, it's prophecy, right? Instead of saying, no, it's not prophecy. You know, th there were indications and the prophetic things that were left behind like by people like the Hopi were indicators that were showing us the roadmap that we must follow if you want to reach that higher enlightened state of consciousness. Frank, there's an, a question in a similar vein in terms of uh, here from Let's Do This Now. Uh, the Sioux talk about, the Lakota talk about a great white brother. Do the Hopi prophecies reflect similar conclusions? Thank you. I can't read much anymore. Um, Apparently, I, I side. <laughs> who, who can read, right? It's who can who reads anymore these days, right? Yeah, that's a good question. The Hopi talk about the um, that they went forth. The, the Masa when they first went up to the fourth world, which is where this all takes place, which is the world we're in now. Um, the, and they ask Masa to become their leader. He says, "No, I will not be your leader. You still have stuff to work out." And he sends them out. And many of them, some of them stay behind and they leave their signs on the rocks as a form of like copyright, you could say, um, branding that says we were here first. We're holding the land and trust for the creator. The others that went into the world, their job was to go out there, multiply, explore, you know, explore technology and then bring that back to their Hopi brethren. Who are still on the land and share with the with the with the idea of enriching both sides. One enriches them with the spiritual side, and the other enriches the technological aspect of it. And what, of course, is happening, we see. In fact, especially with respect to the Hopis, and I saw that very very prevalently on the land, is that the white men, the white brother who came back, didn't come back to enrich and you know empower their Hopi brethren but instead to actually usurp their land, push them off their land, reduce them to poverty, get them addicted to drugs and alcohol. And you see, unfortunately, a divide within the Hopi people themselves so that there was a division. And there was even an elder meeting we were told about where the council decided to make a decision. Are we going to follow the traditional ways or are we going to go the modern way? And that was split. So the minority of people decided to stay and go the normal, the, the, the traditional way. And the majority decided to stay in, um, on the land, which is called Oribe, incidentally. And it's the oldest North American settlement. So the Oribe settlement represents that you know, aspect of the blind Hopi that have adopted the modern ways that are that have all these problems, right? And um, it's kind of sad. So, you know, but yes, the, you know, both of those um, pathways 
have this analogy of the white brother who returns to uh, meet up with the, the red man. Thank you, Frank. Do we have another question? Hold on. Um, no. Bella B, uh, do you think we're closer to world awareness because of this conversation today? <laughs> I certainly <Absolutely>. will. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, come on. Why why else why else would we do this, Frank? But here, it's for you. No, absolutely. I I I you know, I don't want to brag about it, but I'm the whole like you say, the whole purpose of us taking time out of our lives and doing these shows is to introduce these concepts out there for people to begin to let them flow into their lives in whatever way they get inspired. For me, in the very beginning, I was I came from the media world. I was a musician, and and, and I started. I got inspired by great musicians out there who who um, kind of pushed me to develop skills and to pursue, you know, styles and and skill sets that I didn't think I could attain. And and gradually, you do attain them, and it inspires you, and you move forward, and you actually bring that knowledge into the world in that sense. So having a conversation about spiritual things, about technology and binding them together like this, I think is, is a unique thing. And I think it definitely brings us closer to world awareness of everything we talk about. In fact, you showed me some of the numbers last year that we had, hopefully we've matched up a little bit this year as well. Well, I think um, conversations are broadening, but here's, here's honestly, I, I, I'll give it to you straight, Bella B. Uh, Frank's a musician. I'm an I'm a musician. I'm an artist and songwriter. Um, you know, I think we all kind of share the vision of there is this intense time period that we're in, and everybody who can feel it <coughs> is sort of <coughs> listening to the call, and the way that they're called, that's how they apply themselves to the world. That should be what anyone should strive for, anyways. But in an in intense period, we're at war. Let's face it, we are at, a, at, at the essential war that humanity has faced, and it's faced it before, and it lost, and we started again, but we're at war, and we're in this hot phase. So everything we do is what we're truly called and inspired to do, to do just that, to spread not just awareness, but raise the level of consciousness ultimately so we can evolve. If it wasn't for that, I'd be picking my guitar around the bonfire and Frank and Tanya would be there and we'd have a we'd have bonfires five nights of the week and we'd swap stories and play songs and and enjoy, uh, you know, enjoy this experience. And we're going to do that, I think. Um, but for now, this is what we're called to do. And so we're honored that we get to do it. But don't get us wrong. It, it is it is intense. I mean, this year alone. I haven't counted, but I think we're we're sitting probably this year at some 400 shows across all the. It's it's crazy. Think about four, I mean, you you too. You travel. You do. You're here. You're there. You have your. It's it's crazy. Um, but I think we have this extra amount of energy because we're we're showing up for the call, and that gives you this extra boost. At least that's from my perspective. Well, you know, they say be careful what you wish for, right? You might just get it. <laughs> and, you know, I, I've read that, you know, in so many philosophical books and, you know, you wonder what does that really mean, right? Well, the thing is, for me, when I got into music, I always thought as, of it as a vehicle to bring higher frequency messaging into pop music in the form of lyrics or, you know, whatever, you know, the, the vibe of the music or the complexity of the beats and stuff. Um, you know, but basically, you know, what happens is that it manifests and ultimately in whatever form it then manifests. I never expected that you and I would meet up and be talking like this, but it did. And so you got to say to yourself, okay, well, I asked for it, you know, kind of to get out there and to talk and share ideas. So why try to force it to be one thing and not, and just ride with it and see and make use of whatever's there that's presenting itself. And you can still express yourself creatively and you can still pursue the original ideals that you always had. Um, but you have to be aware that once you do that, you kind of open a Pandora's box because like you say, it's like, you know, you're called to do it. People call you and it'd be easy to say no and just disappear. But would that change? You know, would that mean that the world would um, fix itself? Because, like, you know, I could say, you know, David Icke's out there 
he's already handling all this stuff. He's answering all those questions. What? Why should I bother? He's like, you know, Alex Jones. You know, you know, they're all doing. They're all saving us already. They already put in the information out there, right? I don't need to do it anymore. But I think that you know we have to stop thinking about it in terms of us versus them and just say, look, this is my unique signature. I'm going to carry it out there and, and just see what happens. Roll with it until it's over. You know? Boom. Frank, I'm going to I'm going to be rude and jump the gun on this question here. Scorpio asked what is coming. So because it's been in my I wanted to say something for 30 minutes. The question what is coming, whether that's a serious question or you're just playing, it doesn't matter. So many people want to know what exactly is going to transpire so they can prepare for it. And there is an aspect of preparation that we talked about that's legitimate. But here's the most important factors. What are you going to do? What are you going to co-create? What are you putting your intention, your energy, your life force, your love, your time, your focus on? Because that's what's most likely coming in your life. Is that what you you tend to pull in? So why not ask, what are we doing? What is our next step? What are we focusing on? What is it that we want to bring about? What's the vision that we have? I just wanted to jump this question because it's been it's been bugging me because I get this so often. I'm like, I, it, it really depends on us. We should finally realize that the ascension process is becoming a conscious co-creator and not a fucking observer. Okay. I love that you. answer. Off to you, Frank. <laughs> No, that's that's exactly it. I think that's one of the things that this um, that this film made very clear is that the scope of your ultimate influence when everything drops, you know, and there's no more net, there's no more phones, nothing. You know, wh where are you getting your information from and how should you act at that point? You know, you're blind. You're walking blind with the greater picture of the world. Right now, we have this ability to technologically connect with the outside world. But ultimately, when I look at my own life, is like I don't um, try to predict what's coming. I don't, um, you know, people have talked a lot about, and we've talked about it as well, solar events that are coming. Yes, those flares could come. And yes, there's a pole shift looming. And, you know, we showed that. And yes, there's false flag operations. But in, ultimately, when, when they happen, you know, they happen. So your only thing that you can do is be as excellent as you can be in your own little self and in your individualism. And if you're, you know, because this is not a thing of waiting for a savior or trying to predict the future. This is a this is a battle that each of us must fight within ourselves first. We must become the rebels within ourselves first and go up against all those things that we resist to becoming who we truly are, trying to define who you trying to define who you truly are is one of the biggest questions I think we have. And if you are in pursuit of that and you set yourself a certain disciplinary way of getting to that answer, it won't matter what comes. What comes will come. <laughs> yeah, there could be food shortages. Yeah, there could be climate change lockdowns. Yeah, there could be a financial collapse. But, you know, you're going to have to deal with it when it happens anyway. So if you start right now with cleaning up who you really are, how much of you is waste you know thought and you know, investment and wrong energies and wrong thoughts then it'll be easier for you to deal with whatever it is that then finally comes and i also know one thing we learned with our observation of this moving pole situation is that when it reached that 40 degree mark what happened it turned around and went the other way so i i've got no other way to explain that other than maybe there really is something to the idea that our human consciousness when locked together on this resonant level will actually affect the outside world as well so that not just the cosmos is affecting us which we also went into in some of our shows but that we are actually affecting the cosmos with our consciousness so our consciousness is ultimately going to be the driver as to what is coming boom boom aaron the, ongoing discussion in the chat. that's what what is the, the question or it's not a question but i want you to talk about oh it. There have been many channels now that are claiming the white, the whites, I assume the white hats have won. It's probably, man, today they're just hitting me with those questions that I'm itching to go. Go, Frank, go. You want me to take this? Okay, look, um, yeah, the go. white hats. Go and I'll now. share my perspective, okay? Go, go, go. I hear this a lot. And and it's it's for me, it's been a, an underlying element of irritation. 
not because I want to be Debbie Downer and rain on the parade of those people that are moving into the ascension, to the new timeline and the fifth dimension or whatever they call it. But because I think that it's very easy to be lured and it is a definitive strategy of the cabal to use this as a psyop that everything's fine. Stand down ops is what it's called, right? The white hats are here to control, to take care. Everything will be good, right? They did this in the Bolshevik Re revolution. And what happened? Millions of people lost their lives, right? So I think we should stop relying on white hats and we should become the white hats like you are with your white hat. And the more of us that do that, if there really are white hats, and okay, let's just say that there are people that are within organizations that in their own limited scope want to make it better, want to make things better, or fix things for the better, change things for the better, they're only going to do better or be more as successful. This, let me put it this way. The, the level of success that they're going to experience is going to be in direct relationship to the level of consciousness that we as individual white hats have reached. Oh, wow. You, you made that short. I appreciate that. Uh, and basically, I, I can only expand on that maybe with one more layer. And I want to give you practical examples because I am, the thing is there's a lot of truth mixed in these messages. And that's the problem that you don't get a false narrative. You get a true narrative, but with essential false uh, uh, dots in there that that puts you in the wrong direction right so they take you 10 degrees off the truth the, the way i see it is here's the narrative the white hats are in control they've already taken over um we're watching a movie so if a good person a good person that we deem beneficial comes into a position of leadership it only means that the people have already woken up and they have put that person there if a bad person gets to power then the white hats put that person there and it's only to show how bad it could get and they're actually controlling that bad person. Here's the thing. C call me stupid, but people are having real life negative effects. People are dying uh, from, from operations that were worldwide. People are starving. People can't afford to heat their homes any longer. People are committing suicide at a never before seen level. Um, organizations that are highly detrimental to humanity are advancing and AI is spreading. So if that what white hat control looks like, I don't want that shit. And, and honestly, there's only so much that you can justify doing in a clandestine way. There are things that need to be done under wraps for a period of time. But by now, friends, if that's not out in the open and we're not clearly seeing what the objective of this operation was, you have to understand that even if there is a clandestine operation going on, it's probably not to your and my benefit. That's just, I think, whatever we see that are these huge red flags in a public arena that look like a white hat operation are just a power struggle between two opposing groups that want to steer the future, but not. Uh, liberate humanity. There's no, none of that in there. So I'm, uh, you know, it's complex. It's not black or white, but it's most definitely not the way that it's being portrayed. You just sit back, watch the movie, eat the popcorn. And uh, in November, next November, that third weekend, uh, Nasara is going to be activated. It's going to be the third weekend of next November. And on Monday, you won't know because it will be hidden and it will take a while to be implemented and to play out, but you will ne never know until 2037 when Jasara will come in, and that will be activated on the third weekend in November, right before Christmas, but then because of Christmas, you're never going to know about it, and the white hats are in control. I'm, I'm just, I mean, the narratives are just blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no, I can't agree more <laughs> than with what you're saying, John. It's this this sort of, um, this is really a, a cop-out in a lot of ways, because now is not the time to relax. Now is not the time to be eating popcorn and watching the show. Now is the time to rise up and show the world what you're made of as a soul incarnated in a physical body and to show that you know what's at stake. Because I think only when we know what's at stake in the world, what's really at stake in the world, do we have a, an understanding of what we need to be doing on an individual level. 
And so a lot of these sites and people that are talking about this, I don't see it's constructive. I think that we can look at it as there's a goal and that it's written in the field that there is a success. And we talked about that with respect to timelines. There's a there's a positive timeline, absolutely. And But we have to visualize it. We have to work toward it. We can't just expect it's going to happen all on its own because there's things outside of our control that are being handled by the bigger white hats. You know, and it's just, um, I think people that say that are have been too caught up or seduced by ideologies, you know, that like simulation and stuff like that. Hey, it's all just a simulation. Well, you know, the reality is painful. And you mentioned it, what you said is exactly right. There are people that have lost their homes, that have lost their everything. That, it, you know, tell them it's a simulation and that the white hats have won. You know, they're they're just gonna they're just gonna shake their head and go, this person has lost their mind. So it doesn't serve us to have this ideology. Only in the respect that we have, like the Hopis on their on their prophecy rock, we have a depiction of where where what the what's the map? Where are we headed? What part do you belong? What part do you identify with on that map? And and work toward it. We need to work at it. We didn't come here at this time, this crux moment of humanity, to just sit back and watch it happen because never before this is not something your parents or their parent your parents parents had to grapple with because in their reality in their matrix in their world in their lives there was no such thing as technology which could actually infiltrate into your body and take over your mind and take over your physical body and actually exchange it for a technocratic human robotics system that is actually now reality it's no longer science fiction film you know, those things are out there and we're going to have to deal with them. And we need to be talking about them on a, such a large scale. I'm just the biggest shock to me is why aren't more people talking like we are talking about this coming tsunami as Jordy Rose, the inventor of the uh, the of the quantum computer, you know, Q way, the D wave. Sorry. Um, you know, he was saying that over 12 years ago, there's a tsunami coming and it's going to be such a shock. And who's talking about this on a not just on a let's what can we do about it in society what kind of structures can we put in place to cope with the joblessness and the massive change in the way society functions but on a spiritual level what does that mean you know who's doing that we need more of these conversations and it doesn't help us to just think hey the white hats have got this under control i want one more aspect to this frank and i think you put it brilliantly but there's another aspect to this that when people a lot of people in the last 3 years have uh, really got a jump start on this awakening journey, right? Where you go and explore with a very uh, broad mind the the nature of reality, what is true, conspiracies, all of that. The narratives uh, then seem new to you. It's like you you open this new door and everything looks like a shiny object. And it's like, oh my God, and this is there. And I said, Nasara is there, the white hats are there, and Q is there, and everything's there. And oh my God. But these narratives have been around for a very long time. And for those of us, for those of us who've been around in this field for a long time, we've heard it all before over and over and over and over again. The first time that Nasara was activated in the United States for me was 2003. It was the third November, the third weekend of November of 2003. And it's been like that every year since multiple weekends. It's actually already there. You just don't know it. You never feel any effects of it. Nothing gets better, but it's there. And so I get agitated. I get more than irritated. I get agitated. But naturally, if this is your first time opening that door and you see the shiny objects, you don't know. So don't take my word for it. Go and try to find these references that I'm putting out there. And you'll see these narratives are not new. They're just being slightly altered and adjusted to this time period. Ultimately, it's you, your family, the, the people around you. That's a very important structure. Um, and that we have... Quite a lot of influence over. All righty. Uh, shall, shall we do two more questions, Frank? We're done. We're done? Okay, we're done. The boss said we're done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to thank everybody. And I want to just also say that even if I get like this, friends, I never like I never want to like uh, ridicule you for asking a question or anything. I appreciate that very much. Um, but I think there are things that need to be said very clearly. Like the reliance on things and the um, getting addicted to these scenarios where you ultimately never really do anything. You just wait it out. 
Uh, and, and that to me is, it's a scary scenario, right? It's a scary scenario when people just wait for something to happen. Frank, uh, one hour and 52 minutes in, uh, I think this was a great closing for this year for us. Uh, I want to thank you for amazing conversations. Uh, what you put out into the field, what you help people uh, to see. And your webinars, uh, the A Tale of Two Timelines and Inner Looking Glass description in a life uh, in in the in the in the video description, you can find the links. It might be a great Christmas gift to yourself, and maybe you know maybe you're looking for something to binge watch over the holidays. Well, why not something that you're gonna uh, expand your mind with and your awareness with? Go and check out Frank's uh, webinars. They are. I, I think you you get five star ratings. Uh, you know, I've never heard a bad thing about those webinars from anyone. So that's something that's something to be proud of, Frank. Thank you. Well, thanks thanks to you, John. You have a lot to do with that as well. And, and of course, it's just me trying to become a channel of the truth that I see emerging and trying to be a you know a clear channel and uncontaminated and. You know, people may watching this might get the impression that, you know, we're, we're on this high consciousness level and everything's tickle bellow and we're great and we're cool. But, you know, I mean, something I have to remind myself of regularly is that I get caught up in the tediousness of daily life and decisions and emotional stuff, just like everybody else every single day. And I think something that everybody can benefit from, and maybe especially, you know, for this holiday season and in the new year is just the idea of maybe taking time every day to recognize the miracle of what you have now and to celebrate the fact that you're still able to enjoy it. You know, things may not always be this way. So if you want to hold on to this miracle without grasping or clinging in desperation, which is not the Zen way, shout out to Michael McAllister, you should do really should devote some time each day toward being aware of what it is that you can best do to materialize the timeline that you want to find yourself on and your friends and your family. And also to the sacrifice that those who came before you made that led to the freedom that you now still have. This is kind of make it a sacred act, you know, an inner vision a silent prayer for the manifestation of a positive timeline that we all want to inhabit moving into the future. Beautiful. Uh, Frank, happy winter solstice. To me, every year, that is the rebirthing of this Christ consciousness that we talk about this, um, you know, as the the days become longer again, as the the, the trajectory changes, this awake reawakening. And we can remind ourselves uh, every day that it is the birthing and expansion of Christ consciousness within us that is really the return of Jesus Christ in, in the truest sense, where the consciousness of Christ returns in its most beautiful expression uh, to earth. I think that is what we're working on every single day together. Frank Jacob, thank you, my brother. We appreciate you. We love you. Thank you for everything you do. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. And Inspire Tribe, my fellow freedom lovers, you know we appreciate you. We love you. Happy winter solstice. We'll be back before Christmas, but for those who won't see us, Merry Christmas. Uh, however you celebrate, um, celebrate in love and joy and uh, in service, a little bit in service to others as well. We're going to take uh, Frank and myself off the stream here. And with this conversation in hindsight now, I'm going to play the trailer for the Inner Looking Glass once again. Such a beautiful webinar. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, everybody. From the very earliest time, men have used the concept of the I as a symbol of consciousness. Science, past, present, future is converging to the knowledge of higher consciousness. We are at a dynamic moment in history, recognizing that we are local and non-local human beings connected with our sensory system 
which makes use of the pineal gland. This eye is single. There's a mysterious kind of eye. The all-seeing eye of the Masonic lodges. The same all-seeing eye that is found frequently in the artistry of cathedrals. Descartes had ja the tollkühn Behauptung aufgestellt, that the Zirbeldrüse sits der Seele sei. This is why information was classified on it for so many years, because it holds the secret to consciousness. Das Thema Erwachen und Bewusstseinserweiterung hat ganz erheblich etwas mit einer aktiven Zirbeldrüse zu tun. With the pineal gland activated and the two hemispheres energetically united, the neurons within both hemispheres receive the visual stimuli necessary for interactions with the higher worlds. Man must have some means of cognition which is beyond the sensory perceptions as we know them. Each and every one of us has an inner looking glass. All we have to do is activate our own internal portal. <laughs>